turning this morning to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 12, this dramatic event in the history of the early church, Peter being miraculously set free from the prison in Jerusalem. I'll read verse 5. And our subject this morning is the power of prayer and the power of God. The power of prayer and the power of God. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Well, this chapter records the first political persecution of the church. Previously, persecution had largely been fermented by the Jewish religious leaders, but here it was a secular ruler, Herod. Roughly eight years after the persecution that arose when Stephen was martyred, a fresh bout of persecution has arisen. Herod Agrippa, the Herod referred to here, was a favorite of Caligula, a very ruthless Roman Empire, some of you may have heard of. His grandfather, Herod the Great, had been the one who had slaughtered the innocent babies and toddlers in Bethlehem and that region. His father, Herod Antipas, had been the one who beheaded John the Baptist. And so, in this family, there was a very ruthless and violent streak. Josephus tells us that this particular Herod was a pleasant but vain man. He carefully observed the Jewish rites and rituals. He had a Jewish mother, I think, but it was only a veneer of religion. It was for politically expedient reasons that he adhered himself to the Jewish way of life. He wanted to keep the Romans and the Greeks happy, and so he famously organized games and built theaters uh, to appeal to that particular sector of society, but he also wanted to keep the Jews on side. And probably it was with that motivation that he has moved here, firstly to execute James, and then we read uh, here that because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. But that was at the time of the Passover, the seven-day period of the days of unleavened bread, and for the Jews, it was thought improper to execute anyone during the Passover feast. And Peter was therefore kept in prison. And the plan was to bring him out once Easter or the Passover was passed. And then he would be made a public spectacle to the pleasure of the Jews who hated the Christians. Peter would be serenaded before, paraded before all uh, of the Jewish rulers and they would have the satisfaction of see him, seeing him publicly executed. If you look down to verse 11, you'll see there uh, that Peter declares that he had been delivered out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And the word translated expectation there, it carries with it the idea of uh, being anticipating a cruel massacre or slaughter <coughs> of Peter, like uh, waiting wolves or hounds. They were looking for blood and they would soon have the pleasure, so they thought, of seeing Peter's blood spilt. 
Well, who knows what political rulers we may have in days to come. We ought to be deeply thankful to the Lord that however corrupt and ungodly our rulers are, we do not live in days where we face beheadings and executions or burnings at the stake as some of our forebears. So here is the scene. What do we learn from these verses? The first lesson I want us to draw is concerning the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign over all our lives. He was sovereign over James' life. James is taken and there is no divine intervention. Why, we may ask? Well, God always had another James. You read later on in this chapter that Peter says to the disciples at Mary, the mother of John Mark's house, go and tell James. James, the son of Alphaeus, who it would seem had been appointed as the pastor of the Jerusalem church. It may be that the Lord saw fit to call James, the brother of John, home to glory because it was his good pleasure. But then we see that Peter is taken, arrested, seized, put into prison, and God intervenes in a remarkable way. God is sovereign. He may call us home to glory. He may spare others to live a lengthy life here in this sin-cursed world. He is sovereign, and we have to bow to that sovereignty, knowing that all things work together for good to them that love God, who are called according to his purpose. His purpose for James was very different to that of Peter and John. Well, Peter is kept in prison until after the Passover. And we're told here in verse 4 that the night before his imminent planned execution, he was committed to four quaternions of soldiers. A quaternion had four soldiers, and there were four of them, 16 soldiers charged with guarding Peter. It suggested that there were four watches during the night. And so these four sets of guards would rotate every so many hours to keep them alert. Herod had no intention of letting his prisoner escape. Two were handcuffed, one on each side. Peter chained to these soldiers. He was totally secure. Humanly speaking, he was in a seemingly impossible situation. And Peter, thinking of the fate of his dear fellow disciple James, must have assumed that maybe this is my last, light, light, my last night upon earth. But the second lesson then I want to draw from this passage is we learn how to sleep or how it is possible to sleep in a day of trouble. Peter was sleeping, we're told, between two prisoners. Would you have slept? Could I have slept in such a situation, knowing that the minutes were ticking by, the darkness would soon give way to light, the doors of the prison would open, that we would be marched off to beheading or some other gruesome form of execution? Would we sleep? Peter slept. We may say, how was that possible? I, sub I expect that all of us have experienced sleepless nights when we are plagued with anxiety and worry, troubles that have arisen, things that we've got to deal with in the days ahead, and our sleep is taken from us. But 
here the Lord's beloved Peter was given his sleep. I cannot remember the name, but at least one of the martyrs slept very well the day before he was burned. He was so peaceful, so calm. How is it that a person could sleep in the midst of trouble? Well, turn forward to 1 Peter chapter 2. And I think what we read here concerning the Lord Jesus Christ is probably the counsel which Peter reflected upon and was able himself to sleep. In verse 23, we read that Peter says concerning Christ, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. That's what Peter had done here in the prison. He had committed himself to his God and Savior. In his mind's eye, he knew that God was sovereign over his life. Perhaps he remembered past experiences of deliverance, deliverance on the stormy sea of Galilee. And he realized that the Lord could, if it was his will, deliver him. But he committed himself to the Lord. He recalled Christ's sufferings, perhaps, and how his master had gone before, and he was now privileged to tread the same path that his master had trodden. Did he contemplate the sovereign purposes of the Lord and conclude if the Lord intends that my ministry on earth has still a course to run, he will deliver me from this situation. Perhaps he remembered that only a few years before, in the same prison perhaps, the Lord had set his angel and delivered him and he was told to return to the temple and speak the words of the gospel. But above all here, Peter exercised submission and trust. And friends, that's what we must do when we are so fraught with trouble and anxiety. We need grace to submit, to resign ourselves to a sovereign, wise, and loving God in heaven and to trust ourselves wholly to him. Perhaps Peter here anticipated glory. I think it was Latimer and Rid Ridley who embraced the stake that they were about to be burned against and said, this is our wedding day. Before the day is out, we shall be in the presence of our heavenly bridegroom. Did Peter think here that he had only a few hours before entering into the joy of his Lord? And so he slept. By the grace of God, it is possible to know peace and sleep even in the most dark and gloomy hour. And that must encourage us to seek that grace from God. The third lesson we draw here, perhaps a more important one, is the importance of prayer. Verse 5. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Where well, we are going to see, following on from this verse, a remarkable de deliverance. And we may ask, why did the Lord deliver Peter? Well, clearly, the Lord's plan and purpose for him life, his life, was not yet complete. It was certainly a divine rebuke to the enemies of the church and the gospel. It humbled a proud and vain king, as if the Lord said to him, thus far and no further. It demonstrated God's power to thwart in a moment 
the most powerful schemes of men. Who are men in the sight of an almighty God? He can confuse and confound their evil intentions in a moment. That must encourage us. But above all, this verse or this, this narrative illustrates the power of the prayers of the people of God. See what the Lord can do and does do in answer to prayer. That's what this passage speaks to us of above everything else. Do we believe in prayer? Believer, church member, this morning, do you believe in prayer? And is that confidence in prayer, that conviction that you have and I have about prayer, evident in our daily life? You say, oh, I believe in prayer. I believe that God can and does do wonderful things in answer to prayer. How much do we pray then? Do we pray earnestly as the people of God here? We'll look at the, the language in a moment. Or do we pray in a lackluster, occasional way? Friends, if we believed that God, in answer to prayer, can force a passage through iron bars and brazen gates, as Newton put it, surely we should say, I must pray more earnestly. How seriously do we take the prayer meeting? Do we make it our business to unite with the people of God in prayer because we believe that God takes a special delight and has a special ear in the united cry of his dear people on earth? That's what this passage is teaching us. There was a prayer meeting, and in answer to that prayer meeting, God opened the prison doors in a mar remarkable miraculous and irresistible way the Lord appeared for his people prayer is vital but prayer in the appointed purposes of God is effective verse 5 then let's look at the language here firstly but The word but here surely is a contrast to the presumption of Herod and the expectation of the Jews. They assumed with great confidence they had their man, that they would now strangle the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They would silence the most powerful preacher in the city. But that was not to be. Why but prayer. Is that how we see prayer? Well, I cannot, I feel helpless to do anything about this particular situation, but I can pray. That's what the verse is telling us. It's not the but of, well, there's nothing else I can do. It's the but. I can pray. And prayer is God's appointed means to unlock his favor and his power and his delivering grace. Do we have dear ones who are currently bound by the spirit of this world under the power and dominion of unbelief and sin? But prayer... But turn to prayer. The Lord is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask and even think. It's illustrated here. But prayer was made without ceasing. If you have a margin in your Bible, some Bible margins say the phrase here means instant and earnest prayer was made. Without ceasing is in some ways a little bit weaker than the, 
than the thrust of the original language here. The word means to stretch. It could be translated, and indeed elsewhere, it is translated fervent. So it's not simply that they continue to pray. It includes that. But their prayers were fervent. They were heartfelt. They were believing prayers up to a point. They were earnest. Spurgeon probably borrowed the language here when he pleaded with his people in his absence, keep the prayer meeting at white hot heat. Make sure it is fervent prayer. And it was fervent prayer that was made here without ceasing. But thirdly, it was prayer made by the church unto God. The emphasis here is upon collective prayer. It doesn't mean that everyone was together in one place. We know that there were many thousands of believers in Jerusalem. There weren't 5,000 people gathered at the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. But there would have been a great community there. And there must have been other homes dotted about Jerusalem where there was the united cry of the church unto God, Lord, we've lost our James. Are we to lose our Peter as well? In mercy, remember us. See uh, the intentions of the enemies of the gospel. And Lord, in great mercy, appear. Is it possible? Change the heart of Herod. Thwart his plans. They didn't expect the prison to be miraculously opened. But perhaps they thought the Lord could so touch the heart of this ruthless Herod such that he relented. The Lord answered in a way exceeding abundantly above what they thought or expected or even hoped for. When Zion travails, says the prophet, then she will bring forth children. Do we unite in prayer? We must. Prayer is that vital appointed means that God has given to bless his people, to bless the gospel, to the liberation of souls held in the power of sin. And that brings me to my fourth lesson here. Because here is a picture of what God can and does do in the souls of sinners. Yes, there is a very practical uh, narrative here. Peter was released from prison. God, in answer to prayer, often appears for his children in dire straits and deep troubles. And a way is made through the trouble to bring them out of trouble. But also, here is a, a parallel, really, to what the Lord can do and does do in the souls of sinful people. This is an illustration of conversion itself. Let's turn back to the prophecy of Zechariah. It's right at the end of the Old Testament, if you find Matthew, and turn back just a few pages, you'll come to Zechariah. I want to read from chapter 9. And verse 9, and you'll realize that this is a reference to the time of Christ. The prophet is looking forward. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the fall of an ass. So the prophet anticipates Christ the king riding into Jerusalem having salvation with him. And look down to verse 11. As for thee also, 
that's Jerusalem, by the blood of thy covenant, I have sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. Well, this is prophetic language. It's picturing deliverance from sin, from the prison house, the darkness of a life of sin. If we turn to Luke chapter 4, verse 18, very similar sentiments are referred to by the Lord Jesus Christ at the beginning of his ministry. You'll know these verses, surely. He's in the synagogue in Nazareth, and the, the book of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. The setting free of the captives. And the Lord closed the book and said, This day is this scripture, verse 21, fulfilled in your ears. Well, was Christ going to go up to the prison house in Jerusalem or Nazareth and open the gate and let all the prisoners free? Not literally. But this verse speaks of spiritual liberty. The setting free of those who are held in the prison house of sin. Let me read to you the words of Matthew Henry commenting on our verses in Acts chapter 12. He says this, The grace of God, like this angel of the Lord, brings light first into the prison by the opening of the understanding. He smites the sleeping sinner on the side by awakening of the conscience. He causes the chains to fall off from the hands by the renewing of the will and then gives the word of command, gird thyself and follow me. Difficulties are to be passed through, the opposition of Satan and his instruments, a first and second ward, an untoward generation, the world from which we are concerned to save ourselves. And we shall be saved by the grace of God if we put ourselves under the divine conductor. That's what Peter did. And so he's telling us here that there here is a, a very appropriate picture of what it means to be delivered from a life of sin, set free from its power and its curse and brought out into spiritual liberty. That's what conversion is. A Christian is someone who's been set free. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. There is a wonderful liberty that only the true Christian knows when he is set free or she is set free from the power of sin and the darkness of this world. Let me ask this question this morning. Are some of us still in the prison of a sinful life? Are we governed by pride, by selfishness, by an idolatry or an idolizing of earthly pleasures and possessions? These are the things that hold our mind and set the agenda of our life. We don't know the Lord. We have no desire to follow the Lord, no love to him. We cannot love him as we should. Is that our condition? Is it true, perhaps, of some of our loved ones and our friends? We look upon them and say, try as I may, I cannot seem to get through. They seem to be held in a spell, as it were, by the unbelief of this world and its ways. And whatever I do, there seems to be no change. 
Well, these people prayed. And Peter was set free from his impossible prison situation. And if we cry out to the Lord for ourselves, or we cry out for our loved ones, it may be that the Lord in his sovereign love and kindness will set us free and set our loved ones free from the prison house of sin. Let's just go through some of the phrases that are set before us here in this passage that speak of Peter's liberty, setting free. Firstly, come to verse 7. We read in the middle of this verse, a light shined in the prison. When the Lord deals with our souls, that's usually where he begins. A light begins to shine where there was no light before. We have a new clarity. We begin to see things that we never noticed before. We see sins in our life that we were oblivious to before. We see the solemnity of death and eternity in a way that never really passed through our thoughts before. We see something of the emptiness of this world. Its pleasures no longer delight us as they once did. We see our worldly friends in a new light. We once thought that they were the best people, the people we wanted to spend all our time with, we wanted to imitate them. We wanted to carry their favor and court their friendship. But now we can see that they're on that broad way to destruction. We begin to discern that this world is a world that breaks its promises. It seems to invite our confidence and our trust, but we begin to see through it. It may be the Lord brings some trouble into our life and that trouble is like a, a light bulb moment and we see for the first time that the world is not all that is cracked up to be that life here is plagued with misery well there was light Peter was then we read he was smote on his on the side he was given a sharp jolt or nudge it awoke him out of his sleep. And as Matthew Henry puts it, the Lord, when he, has to, when he des desires to bring us out of the prison of our old sinful life, sometimes he has to bring our conscience up with a sharp uh, nudge, a sharp uh, hit to the side, as it were. Has the Lord so done that with us? Our conscience was asleep. We were living carelessly. But now there's a new consciousness of our guilt. The sinfulness of sin. We see how unreasonable we have been to take our lives and steal away from the Lord who gave us health and breath and life and strength. And we, we've been determined to shut out the Lord from our thoughts and affections saying, I've got no time for God. And now we see how unreasonable we've been. Perhaps some of the older ones here, you look back on a, a life of, of 70, 80 years, where really you've excluded the Lord. But now the Lord in his mercy, he's brought you up with a jo sharp jolt, and you begin to see, how have I lived? How unreasonable I've been to cold shoulder the Lord for all these years to ignore him. Then we read here that Peter's chains fell off from his hands. Up until this point, Peter, if he wanted to, couldn't move. Only a little bit. He couldn't set himself free. He was in a helpless condition constrained by the guards. What a picture this is of what Martin Luther famously described as the bondage 
of the will. In our sinful state and way of life, our very will is held in bondage by sin. Sin dictates all our decision making. Sin determines life choices. And to choose the ways of the Lord to please him is beyond us. Selfishness and pride and fleshly desires, they dictate all that we do, the way we react to situations, the way we interact with others. It's all marked by a will that is held in bondage by the power of sin and the fall at the beginning of time. There's no power or inclination in our unconverted state to please God. We please ourselves. Self comes first. The here and now dominates the agenda. But now, Peter has discovered that the chains, the shackles, have been miraculously removed. And he's told, gird yourself, dress yourself, put on your sandals. He would have struggled to do that before with all the constraints of the chains. But now, he's free. What a picture this is of God's converting grace. When once before, all we could do was please our old sinful self with its corrupt tastes and desires. Now we say, Lord, what will you have me do? I want to please the Lord. I want to know him and walk in his ways. I want to delight in his commandments and follow him and please him. Has that experience come to you? Can you say there was a time, not too long ago perhaps, where I never thought like this? But now, every day, when I'm tempted to sin, there's something that serves as a powerful check. And I say, but I want to please the Lord. I want to follow him. We have a desire to draw near in prayer. We have a new hunger for his word. Our will has been renewed. That's conversion. It's emancipation from the dominion of sin. My heart is made free. My desires, my affections, my interests are now Godward and Christward in a way they never could have been before. There's a remarkable parallel between Peter's liberty here and the liberty he had been the instrument in giving to so many that were praying for him. They could say, perhaps not quite so consciously as I'm putting it here, but they could have said it was through Peter that we were delivered from the spell of our old Jewish religion, the ignorance that the depravity of our own fallen natures. What powerful work the Lord has done in our heart. He set me free. Lord, can you not set Peter free in a literal way? It's no more difficult to set Peter free from that prison and the clutches of Herod than it was to set me free in my soul from the power of Satan and sin and unbelief and the spell of this fallen world. Well, Peter is told, time is running away from me, in verse 9, sorry, at the end of verse 8, Peter is told, put your sandals on, cast your garment about you, and follow me. He's now enabled. His heart is free. His shackles are gone. And is it not true when the Lord brings us to that point where we have a new clarity, we understand the things of God, we understand and appreciate the loveliness of Christ, our conscience is now sensitive, 
the constraints and the shackles of the old sinful way, life are broken, the Lord says to us, follow me. And that's what Peter had to do here, as Matthew Henry puts it. We have to pass through dangers and difficulties just as Peter had to pass those prison guards, the two guards that, en that kept him before he got to the outside gate that led to glorious liberty within the city that Peter had to follow. And that's the Lord's way in conversion. He breaks the power of sin in our life and then he says, follow me. Follow my word. Keep the commandments. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your eye upon him. Imitate him. Trust your soul to him. Now Peter must have trusted the angel here, the messenger of God. He would have kept his eye firmly upon the angel surely when he saw the guards miraculously sleeping and he comes to ultimate liberty. Let's just look briefly at the reactions that took place. Perhaps we only have time this morning to look at the reaction of the praying believers. Peter comes out of the prison. He comes to himself. He realizes that it's not a dream. When the Lord turned the captivity of Zion, Psalm 126, we read, then we were like them that dream. And sometimes some of us here can say when we were first saved, it was like a dream. We didn't think it was real. Things were so different. Our tastes, our interests were so different. Where there had former been no thought for the Lord, a cold, disinterested heart, now I was so warm to the Lord, so earnest, such an attraction to his people. Well, Peter, he finds his way to John Mark's mother's house. And there he knocks. And the young girl who is sent to hearken, the, the word hearken here, or the idea, is not that she came just to listen. We would say she came to answer the door. She heard the knock and she was to answer the door. But she hears Peter's voice. So thrilled, so believing is this young girl that she goes and announces to everybody but they cannot believe that the Lord has answered their prayer in such a remarkable way. Would we be any different? Probably not. Sometimes the Lord answers our prayers we cannot expect. We do not think he can, but let's be encouraged. Peter beckons to them. He tells them what had happened, and then he says, go and tell James. Go tell the pastor. He must have been troubled to know if another fellow apostle would soon enter heaven James is given the good news. Peter, in prudence, does not remain. He knows that the watch will soon be sent to search the streets, to inquire, where was Peter gone? And so Peter makes himself scarce. But what an answer to prayer is set before us here. Prayer was phrased here, framed here, as the very cause. It was the power of prayer that unlocked the power of God that set Peter free. Many of us here, we are the answers to prayer. Our parents, our grandparents, our friends, our neighbors, our Sunday school teachers, they have prayed for us. It may be in the church in the town has prayed for us, and the Lord in mercy has set us free and called us to himself. We cannot neglect prayer as a church. If we do, 
we should not expect that the Lord would bless us with conversions, with fruit, with the joy of seeing unexpected converts. If Peter was an unexpected knock on the door at this house, then we can expect the unexpected convert. People who we thought, I cannot imagine them being anything different than being the proud, careless teenager that they have been. I cannot imagine that old person who has become so, so uh, stubborn in their rejection of the Lord. I cannot imagine them set free. But the Lord is able to do it. This chapter proves it. Well, let's pray together. Lord, we thank thee for thy holy word, for the remarkable release of Peter from his captive prison. And we look to thee, Lord, thou art able to repeat this same miracle and set free the lost and sinful souls that are so dear to us, bringing them from the captivity of sin and the darkness of this world into the glorious liberty and light of thy dear Son. O oh Lord, do these things. Get honour and glory to thy name, that there may be joy in the streets of Jerusalem and joy in the presence of the angels in heaven over repenting sinners. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We close our worship with him, 420. 420. And can it be that I should gain an interest?